thank you for the introduction, Shanti. And uh, thank you, Jennifer, also for organizing. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, glad to see you all here. I see some old friends, some new faces also. So um, yeah, so we have uh, these four sessions, four sessions to spend together over the next uh, two days, today and tomorrow, of um, two hours each. So one session now, and then um, while well, you're all in different places in the world, so it's different times of day, but <clears throat> here in India, it's, uh, well, this is the morning session, and then we'll have one evening session, three to five, and then tomorrow, the same timing. So, um, yeah, I mean, the main thing, I was thinking the main thing we want to, um, I think we want to achieve over four sessions is um, at least create some merit right, create some cause for um, happiness and well-being, uh, not only for ourselves, but for all sentient beings in the world. Um, and then within that, especially, we want to um, at least have, get some confidence that we understand how to meditate on our mind, right, taking our, which means, you know, when we meditate, we always have an object of meditation, something that we're focusing our attention on. So um, in this course, especially, we're going to try to um, learn how to and become familiar with taking our own mind as the object of meditation, right? So sometimes we take our breath as an object of meditation or we take our feelings um, or, you know, uh, uh, a particular attitude like love or compassion um, or patience. But um, in this case, in this course, we want to try to especially focus on just in general taking our mind, the conventional nature and also a little bit the ultimate nature of our mind as the object of meditation. Um, yeah, and then sort of learning how to and becoming somewhat confident in, um, in doing that, right? So, um, so I'm planning each session, we'll um, start with a positive motivation. We'll do, we'll do a little bit more extensive motivation here at the beginning of the first session. And we'll do a little bit more extensive dedication at the end of the last session. Um, but each session will start with a motivation and with a dedication. And then um, we'll do a, um, yeah, then mainly I'll explain some different aspects. So I have kind of four general topics um, laid out in mind to talk about. First, about what, what, why it's important to, um, to meditate on the mind, to you know, do placement and analytical meditation on the mind itself in the first session. Then the second session, more about, well, what, what is the mind? And how does that relate to different aspects um, about why it's important to maintain the mind? And then the third session, um, more impermanence, looking at the impermanence and the dependent arising nature of the mind. And then in the fourth session, looking at the ultimate nature of the mind, right? its emptiness and inherent existence. Right. So we'll look at kind of over four sessions, look at those four topics: um, why it's important to meditate on the mind, what is the mind, its conventional nature especially the impermanence and dependent arising nature of the mind. And then finally, the mind's emptiness of inherent existence or its ultimate, um, ultimate nature. So, um, yeah, so let's start now this session with uh, generating positive motivation first. So this is an introductory, uh, not introductory, it's intermediate level course. Right? So I assume you're all kind of somewhat familiar with um, different levels of motivation, right? So um, in, uh, yeah, we're, I mean, Root Institute and FBMT and um, so this course, we're um, practicing within the um, Sanskrit tradition of the Bodhisattva Yana, the Mahayana traditional Buddhism. So we always try to make our motivation for any Dharma activity and in general, anything we do in life, um, a bodhicitta motivation, which means we should try to, uh, to the best of our ability to think that we're not doing. So now in the case, in this situation, right, in this context, um, this two hour session that we're not doing for ourselves alone, not just a selfish um, activity. And we're not doing just for the well-being of this life alone. But think how um, uh, this life, everything we enjoy in this life, our life itself comes from our mother and father, our parents, and they from our grandparents, and they from our great grandparents, and so forth, on back in an infinite chain of causation. Um, 
And then everything we enjoy in, in this life, physical and mental experiences, all comes about in dependence upon countless other sentient beings. Right? So therefore, um, we, um, we engage in this, this activity, not only to bring about well-being and benefit for ourselves, but also to bring about well-being and benefit benefit for the in, infinite interconnected um, web of phenomena with which we're related and with, on which our, our lives depend. Um, yeah, so it's good if we can visualize ourselves surrounded by all sentient beings, beginning with um, <clears throat> our father of this life, our immediate right, and then all of our male friends and family. So if you can imagine, uh, briefly bring to mind all of, the, all of your male friends and family, your father, uncles, grandparents, if you have a husband or sons, male cousins and friends. Imagine them all to your right and behind you and recognize how you're inter interconnected, interconnected with them. And then um, bring to mind your mother of this life. Imagine that she's seated directly at your left and then next to her and behind her and behind you are all your other female um, family and friends, your grand grandmothers and aunts and so forth. And then visualize the people whom you're most prone to become angry with, irritated or angry with, seated directly in front of you, facing towards you because we have to put special effort into um, practicing patience and generating kindness uh, towards these people. And then imagine all the other sentient beings in the universe who from life to life have been in these different relationships, have been at times our, our worst enemies, at times our dearest friends, our parents, our siblings. But in this life, they, they um, appear in the aspect of strangers. So imagine all the other sentient beings of the six realms, from the hell realms up to the formless realms. Imagine them all appearing in the aspect of humans um, in order to create an auspicious connection that they can actually um, engage in these kind of practices and, and meet the Dharma, practice the, the Dharma together with us. So for that reason, we um, yeah, imagine them all in human aspect, in human form. So imagine all the other sentient beings in the universe seated around us. So again, reflect how every, um, every happiness and experience of well-being we've ever experienced in samsara until now has all come about in dependence upon these other sentient beings. So try to generate a sense of gratitude. And then reflect how all the other sentient beings are exactly the same as us in um, wanting to be free from every kind of misery and suffering and how they experience countless kinds of uh, misery and suffering from sickness to loneliness, confusion, just like we do. So if you the suffering of oneself and other sentient beings as well, and try to generate um, initially a motivation of compassion, thinking whatever we do during this session and then this, uh, this two-day course, may it all become causes, multiple causes, to free ourselves and all sentient beings from every form of suffering. The sufferings of uh, this life, the suffering of samsara um, in general as well. So we can try to think that um, by engaging in this course together, you know, we create causes to free all sentient beings from the oceans of some side of suffering.
And then reflect how all sentient beings are the same as oneself and wishing to have um, well-being, only happiness and only well-being. Although they have countless different interpretations of what happiness is and what are the most kind of worthwhile happiness to strive for. But all sentient beings are the same and wishing to have well-being and happiness. So we can try to generate and they, and they lacking you know, so much lacking that happens. So try to generate the aspiration that, um, you know, what happiness I have and other sentient beings have may it increase. And what happiness we don't have, such as the happiness of the peace of liberation from samsara and um, inexpressible joy of complete enlightenment. Well, may we have that. And so may whatever we do during this course together, may it all become causes uh, to bring about the happiness, um, temporary and ultimate happiness of ourselves and all sentient beings without excluding them. So then finally try to generate the, um, the aspiration for oneself that in order to bring all of this about, in order to free all sentient beings from suffering and in order to bring all sentient beings to the peerless state of, um, of the happiness of full enlightenment, then I myself, the oneself, so here we take a sense of personal responsibility, and I myself must do whatever I can to quickly become fully enlightened and thereby have the the wisdom, the knowledge, the skills, and ability to lead all sentient beings to, um, you know, to liberation and enlightenment. So, therefore, I'll engage in this, um, this session and this course. All right, so, compelled by the, the aspiration to benefit all sentient beings, we will generate the aspiration to, um, to achieve full enlightenment. So this is um, Bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. And then if you like, you can, um, so we'll try to generate attitude of refuge. So if you like, you can generate or visualize Shakyamuni Buddha or um, you know, another, another object of, um, of refuge, field of refuge in the space before you. Um, yeah, but typical is Shakyamuni Buddha. So if you like, visualize Shakyamuni Buddha seated upon a, um, a golden throne su supported by, let's say, eight uh, snow lions. Then imagine a, uh, an embellished throne supported by eight snow lions. Upon that is a fully open lotus blossom. On Lotus Blossom is a sun disk and a moon disk. So a disk of golden light, a disk of white light. And upon that sits Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, his, bodies, his body is made of um, brilliant golden light. Whereas the three robes of a fully ordained monk. That he's seated, seated in the Vajra cross like a posture. His right hand is um, resting palm down, palm face down on his right knee. The tip of his um, the middle finger of his right hand touches this, the moon disk upon which he sits. And his left hand is resting palm face up in his lap, in the mudra of meditative equipoise, holding a begging bowl filled with um, blissful nectar. And he wears the um, saffron colored robes of a fully ordained monk. Uh, his face is very uh, luminous and looks upon you with great affection. His lips are ruby red and his, um, the corners of his mouth are turned up in a gentle smile. His eyes are half closed. 
and representing that he is continually in meditative absorption on the ultimate nature of phenomena. And his eyes are half open, representing that he as well continually um, looks at and sees the plight of all situations with loving concern. And then his hair is blue, black in color, each hair tightly curled to the right. And up on the crown of his head is a, a golden protrusion, Vishnisha, representing his perfect practice of um, guru devotion over countless lives. So I think that uh, Shakyamuni Buddha is one nature with your own um, guru, your own teacher, is one nature with all the Buddhas and the Sabas. And then um, especially try to bring to mind how the Buddha has the, um, the power to, how the Buddha actually embodies the Dharma as well, the teaching and the Sangha, and how he has the, um, so these three jewels of refuge, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, how they have the ability to protect us from the suffering of um, samsara in general, especially the suffering of the lower realms, and the ability to lead us to um, the freedom from samsara and to the state of full enlightenment by teaching the truth of how, you know, what are the causes of samsara, what are the causes of enlightenment, and thereby enabling us to, um, to practice accordingly and to achieve the results that we desire. So uh, to whatever degree you can, try to generate um, uh, faith based on understanding right, in the uh, Buddha Dharma Sangha. Then we can recite the refuge prayer. Um, yeah, Sandy, do you have it there? <laughs> I it up. You can share it now if you have it. Otherwise, we'll just recite it. Yes, Venerable, just a moment. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the virtues that I create, the giving and other perfections, may I achieve the state of a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme um, Assembly. By the merits that I create, the listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits that I create, the listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. And then we can offer um, a mandala. Uh, yeah, there's just a short mandala. Yeah, so it's there at the bottom. This ground, anointed with perfume, stream of flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. Um, by this, may all sentient beings achieve the state of full enlightenment. Excuse me, again. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure land. Okay. Um, so then, actually, I wanted to start also. I'll share my screen now. Just to uh, start with this this um, verse of praise that is following this often recites at the beginning of the teachings. I prostrate to Gautama, so Gautama Buddha, who through compassion taught the exalted Dharma, which leads to the relinquishing of all views. Um, okay, so then why meditate on the mind and the nature of the mind? Right? Um, <clears throat> Hmm. There's many different ways to um, okay. There's many different ways to approach this whole um, question. Yeah, I was thinking. I mean, I was trying to prepare. I didn't get a lot of time to prepare to prepare for this course, um, but um, yeah. So I was thinking about different ways. I mean, there's all different ways to go with presenting the mind, right? Um, because 
it's not like, you know, like many other topics like the precious human rebirth and permanence and death or karma. There are very clear outlines. There's a very standard way to present them as laid out in the, in the Lam Rim, in the graduated um, treaties and the graduated path to enlightenment kind of texts. But the mind, there's not, it's kind of something that comes up, you know, different aspects of the mind, different um, ways that the mind is important, different ways to, um, um, to, to train and transform the mind. It's something that comes up in different places and different aspects of Buddhist teachings in many different ways. Um, so yeah, so there's many different directions to go with it. But um, yeah, um, but it all, it all comes down to basically, I mean, basically Buddhist teachings are all for the purpose of um, freeing sentient beings, reducing and free, you know, ultimately eliminating suffering, right? Of one person as an individual, of all sorts of beings, you know, as all, all individuals. Um, so the Buddhist teachings are all for the purpose of, yeah, eliminating, reducing and eliminating suffering by eliminating the causes of suffering and by bringing about the well-being and happiness of all sorts of beings, by creating, showing us how to create the causes of happiness. Um, so basically all, I mean, the, the main causes of, um, of suffering and happiness are within our own minds. It's not external things, but it's, I mean, happiness, first of all, happiness is something we experience in our mind, isn't it, right? Is happiness something that is outside of us? Like, can you look outside and find anything that is happiness? There definitely might be things outside of us that make us feel happy, you know, like a favorite food or a favorite person or some music or a movie or, you know, a beautiful sunset, fresh air. All those things can help induce an experience of happiness. But when we look for, you know, that the, the actual experience, you know, when we have our favorite food, when we talk to you know, a favorite person, um, when we just feel in a good mood, you know, that experience of well-being that we have, the experience of happiness that we have, is it something that's outside of us? Is it in the physical world around us? Or is it in, you know, another person's mind? Or is it something that's in our, our own computer, our own mind? You know. So try to bring to mind like just an experience of happiness uh, right now you might have had recently. And just reflect how that that experience of well-being and happiness is within one's own mind. Right. So um, so there's definitely that different external causes and conditions can contribute to you know our happiness like, um, and to our, our suffering as well. But, you know, the actual experience of suffering that we have is something that, that happens within our continuum, right? So what by our continuum, I mean, the, um, the stream of existence that we, that we are as a person, the stream of existence that we have, you could say that we have, or that we are as a person, right? So as a person, we have a continuum. There's a continuum of our body, in our continuum of, of our mind. So a continuum in what sense? And that, in that it's something that exists through time, right? So just like a river flows across a landscape. And so there's, you know, there's a continuum of water, you know, like a lake is not a, it's, it's not a, well, it doesn't have a flow to it really. <laughs> it's more or less a stagnant. I mean, of course, there's some streams coming in, some streams flowing out, but the lake just stays in the same place. Whereas a river is a body of water that's continually moving, right? It's moving through space, right? So there's a continuum of a river or a stream because there's a, there's a, wa there's a water that's flowing across a landscape, right? So similar to that, us as a person, we're a lot like a river or a stream in that we're, we're an existence of something, but we're not static in one place in time, right? We're not static at one time, but rather we're continually changing and we're changing in such a way that we exist through time, right? Our existence is kind of flowing across the landscape of time, if you will. So this, so the everything that 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 constitutes our existence through time as a person is part of our continuum, right? So there's a continuum of our body and our continuum of our mind. Right. So when we look at where does our happiness um, and our our suffering exists, it exists only within our continuum, 
within this continuum of stuff that makes us up as a person, right? It doesn't, our happiness, you know, doesn't exist in someone else's mind. And it also doesn't exist in the external environment around us, but rather it exists within our own mind. So then, you know, when we look to, to try to, um, I mean, fundamentally we want, we want happiness, we don't want suffering, right? Um, so, but as I say that, I'm already thinking, because I, I, I try to think in terms of skeptics, right? Because I really appreciate skeptics. Um, so I hope there's some good skeptics among you. Um, so already, as I just say, say you know, something that we, we usually just take that for granted in Buddhism, right? That every, every sentient being wants happiness and doesn't want suffering. Um, but that's, you know, we can also challenge that, ask questions about that. So. If you, whatever, you know, whatever, anything I'm saying, you're welcome to challenge and ask questions about. But um, yeah, so I'll try to give ample, ample opportunity for you to ask questions. But um, um, yeah, but some things, you know, like that, that we generally take for granted. If I stop and explain, you know, every detail about it, then we never get to the main point of um, this course, right? So, but um, yeah, so yeah. Um, but if you want to, and if you want to challenge anything I'm saying, you're welcome to challenge me on it. And if you want to challenge, then just do so. You bear any questions, but make a note so you don't forget. And we'll come back to it. So um, yeah, so every sense of being, uh, you know, wants happiness and doesn't want suffering. From the tiniest insect, you know, even micro uh, microorganisms. So how do we? How can we know that a tiny insect or microorganism wants uh, wants well-being and doesn't want suffering? Well, I don't know, let's take, let's take something a little easier to look at, like ants, you know? If you put something, some food, some kind of food out that ants like, like some sweet piece of sweet fruit or um, you know, liquid or some salty crumbs from biscuits or something, then, um, then the ants, they, you know, if it's something that they like, you know, so I've noticed some kind of ants, they really like sweet stuff and some kind of ants, they like more like, they don't like sweet things. They're more interested in like, you know, like um, insect wings or dead, dead animal, dead like cockroaches and stuff like that. I don't know, that's just what I see around here. But um, um, yeah, and if there's one particular kind of ant that's outside my room, very big kind of, I don't know if you call them fire ants. They're very vicious kind of ants. They really, they really hurt when they bite. But those ants, they're not, they're not interested in sweet things at all, but they love like dead grasshoppers and dead cockroaches. When they find them outside, those things they'll spend hours kind of gnawing on. So, so you see that you know when they when there's some kind of food that they like that you know probably sustains their life better, helps you know, nourish their whole colony, um, that and that thereby kind of tastes good to them. Then they they go to that. Right? They try to find it out, and when they when they find it, they get excited and they tell all their friends about it, and all their friends come, and they all kind of enjoy it together. Um, Whereas when they, and those kind of ancestors specifically, if you, they, they build nests from, they, um, I think from their mouths, they make some kind of, it's kind of like the spider web material. Um, and they, they, pull, they pull leaves together and sew them together and build these big nests. Um, but if you kind of go near the nest and just tap it or touch it, they, they, they perceive that as a threat. And, Immediately, there's an expression of like danger, fear, um, you know, and defensiveness, um, and they you can you can really see that they get they get riled up, they get agitated, um, so their minds are disturbed in that in that moment um, because they they perceive a threat to their life, right? a threat to their well-being. So even on a very basic level, fundamental level, sentient beings, they you know they when they when they're free from the fear of a threat to their life, um, you know, free from uh, free from the threat of harm, then they feel more at ease and peace. And when they when they encounter something that they, they like, something that they perceive as um, um, contributing to the well-being of their body or the well-being of their mind, then they feel happy, right? And so they want that they want things that's, that 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 um, contribute to the well-being, to the sustenance of their life. To the flourishing of their life, right, in some way. So even you know, in, I mean, as as humans, of course, we're much more complex. But when we perceive something that, and we perceive that something is somehow contributing to the flourishing of our life, naturally we feel happy, we feel joyful at 
you know, having that. Um, when we perceive something, even, you know, even, a, even a comment, even expression, an expression on someone else's face that we feel is threatening, is possibly um, harmful to, to our flourishing, then we feel you know, um, unhappy in some way. So all Zen means are similar to that. So because, and because happiness and suffering are things experienced in our mind, in our minds, while we do need, uh, of course we do need physical sustenance, um, and protection in a physical way. But, you know, is it, well, is it possible that we can even, that although we have uh, physical sustenance and we're free from physical harm, you know, free from sickness, free from hunger, free from thirst, you know, our rent is paid, you know, we have good savings. We don't have to worry about, you know, for the next few years at least, don't have to worry about, you know, shelter, or clothing, or food, or water, or you know, medic medical care, and so forth. Um, is it possible we can have all of those things that 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 provide for our physical sustenance and well-being, but still not be happy? Right? Yeah, I think I think you know quite clearly so. I mean, as one one thing is Holiness Dalai Lama often points out is that you know as human beings we're social creatures. Um, as are most all mammals. Um, so, you know, think about someone like um, one of the harshest punishments in, in, um, yeah, in human society is solitary confinement, right? Where you, you know, put a prisoner in a room all by themselves. So in that case, you know, the, the person, they have shelter, they're safe, you know, no one's gonna harm them. Um, they have food um, and clothing and so forth. But just the, the fact of being alone you know, is for many, for most people, probably extremely uh, a source of a lot of suffering, right? So we also do need, in, in, in addition to physical sustenance, we also do need um, companionship and friendship, right, from other people. Um, but is it possible even we can also have um, friendship, companionship, you know, have supportive, loving family and friends? Um, in addition to all the physical things we need to sustain our life and still not be happy. Right. Is that also possible? <laughs> what do you think? That you can have good friends, family, have education, even, even have status in society, um, have enough wealth, you know, all the physical things we need and still not be happy. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely true. I mean, we can see either, I mean, I've had in my own experience, we can see in the experience of many other people, right? That um, just those external things, friends and family um, and physical things, wealth and status and society, reputation, um, they, those things alone cannot, they don't guarantee happiness and well-being. Of course, they make it more easy, probably more likely to have, but, um, but they definitely don't guarantee it, right? So, um, I mean, one, um, one thing that's taught in Buddhism, and I think it's very true, um, is that, you know, we really have to, happiness is something that, I mean, well, first of all, happiness, I'm trying to make the point, is something that exists in our minds. And it's something that at some, sometimes it spontaneously arises in the mind, but it doesn't always spontaneously arise in the mind. Sometimes have suffering, I and mean, more more often than not, difficulty, suffering arises spontaneously in the mind. But both of those, um, I think, well, it's not that we have no control over what happens in our mind, right? I guess that that's probably kind of the, the main point of this this course, which I hope to convince you of, is that we have some control of what happens in our mind. Um, and why I think that's something. In some way, it might even seem trivial to try to you know, say that I want to convince you of that. But I think there's some different reasons why actually we don't really believe that at a deep level. Um, I know looking at my own experience, I remember when I, you know, when I first came to the monastery here, um, the first four years I lived at, I lived with the other monks from Kopan Monastery. Um, all the monks from Kopan Monastery who study here at Sarah, they all live in one hostel together, Kopan now. So I lived there for the first four years. So the first four years I was here, I had a really difficult time. 
because my Tibetan wasn't very, my spoken Tibetan wasn't very good when I came. My written Tibetan was even worse. I didn't know how to debate. I didn't, I wasn't very good at memorizing. Um, so, and then, you know, when I went to class, you know, to try to receive explanation of the text we're debating because my Tibetan wasn't very good. I couldn't, I could only understand like a 10th of what the teacher was saying. So it kind of felt like a total failure. <laughs> and then when I went to debate, you know, other monks didn't want to debate with me because I couldn't understand what they're saying and they couldn't understand my pronunciation. So anyway, it was the first few years were really, really difficult here. So sometimes I would get, I'd be really miserable you know, for weeks at a time. And I remember sometimes the other monks, the older monks at Kumpan House, they'd come to my room and see I was really, see that I was really unhappy. And they'd kind of say like, you know, why are you un so unhappy? You have to make yourself happy. <laughs> and that would just make me more angry. I'd just get more irritated. Like, what are you saying? Like, I have to make myself unmiserable. Can't you see? Like, how am I supposed to make myself happy? You know? So it really perplexed me for a while. Like, how am I supposed to make myself happy? Like, I mean, the things that the ways that I used to make myself happy before I became a monk, like I can't do half of those anymore. Right? <laughs> or before I came to the monastery, you know, like when, you know, when I was an adolescent and you're unhappy, you know, many friends, you use drugs or alcohol or just kind of distract yourself by going out, you know, playing, you know, playing, a, playing a soccer game or going to see a movie or, you know, we use something external to distract our attention just try to forget about whatever it is that's kind of making us feel bored or making us kind of worry um, and just go do something that we enjoy. But when you're, you know, you're here in a monastery, you're a monk, you're part of a study program, you can't go to the movies, you know, you can't go play football, you can't uh, just go have a drink with your friends. Um, so you really, but, but, that's, but that's kind of the point of, of the Buddha recommending this kind of life is to really make you face your own mind, really not, not try to um, create conditions where you really have to learn to not seek out kind of very superficial, temporary um, forms of pleasure and enjoyment um, by just, yeah, by just escaping, kind of escaping what it is that's, that's disturbing us, but causing us to really just face the situation that we're in you know, straight on and, and learn to be happy in even a difficult situation, um, right? So, um, yeah, so it was a big question for me for yeah, a few years, like, how am I supposed to, um, how am I supposed to create happiness in my, in my own mind, right? But that's, I mean, that's kind of partly why I became, I mean, uh, well, why I came to Asia to, to kind of learn about meditation um, in the first place. When I was in my mid twenties, I had a really difficult time. Uh, at one point, it was quite. Um, um, anyway, I kind of had the, one of those crisis moments where I was like, "Okay, you know, my life looks like my life is falling apart. I have to try to figure out how to like turn it in a good direction, in a, in a, in a healthy direction." And um, yeah, through my own reflection, it. And I've kind of thought about doing many different things, like maybe being a sculptor, because I myself like going to museums, looking at you know, paintings and sculptures. I'm hopeless at drawing and painting, but I kind of like you know making more three-dimensional objects. Um, but then uh, you know, but then or maybe being like um, an architect, because you know I really enjoy going to beautiful buildings, being in you know, big big open halls and nice parks that are well designed or geometrically designed you know, buildings and um, you know, public spaces and so forth. But then it, it reflect, you know, it kind of appeared to me that most of those things though, that, you know, like art, architecture, even literature, and novels, it's true, those things do bring us a lot of inspiration, and joy and happiness, but mostly that happiness, it doesn't last for very long. Like we go to a museum, we enjoy being there for the afternoon and then, you know, and then we leave and then by the next day, it's almost just, just like you know, a dream of last night. It doesn't have that much effect on us. Um, um, and, and most kind of artworks we enjoy is sort of similar. And some people enjoy you know, those things and some people don't, it's not really guaranteed. Whereas you know, meditation, when we, when we um, learn to just um, sit quietly, uh, let go of kind of distracting thoughts and distracting perceptions, 
kind of center our attention within. Um, and we can, I mean, we can quite easily you know, watch our breath, for example, we can quite easily learn to bring some peace uh, to our own mind. And that's something that, you know, wherever we are, you know, wherever we're, wherever we're at, whatever time of day, we can always come back to that, you know, um, just kind of simple meditation, centering our attention, letting go of distracting thoughts and perceptions and finding some kind of uh, peace within. So that's a much more reliable um, source of happiness than, you know, than other things um, like artwork or architecture or you know, music or literature and so forth. So, um, and also just this fact that happiness is something we experience in our own mind. So if we can learn to, you know, using just tools that we ourselves possess to, you know, affect our, you know, direct our attention in, in certain ways and think in, in ways that bring a sense of satisfaction and well-being to our own mind, then that's, that's a much more, um, again, that's something we can learn to use in any situation, at any time. Um, and thereby, it's a much more reliable kind of source of, of happiness than is, um, you know, for ourselves. And then if we can teach that kind of method to others, it's a much more reliable source of happiness for others than is trying to, you know, um, create artwork or buildings or um, you know, architectural design and so forth. Not that those other things aren't good. Like, we need all different kinds of, you know, skills and crafts in the world. But um, to me, it seemed like, yeah, I also just like meditating, right? So um, that's kind of why I sort of came to Asia back in 1999 to learn about meditation was because it just seemed like a, um, a, a more direct way to bring about well-being and happiness than most other kind of human activities, right, that we engage in. Um, hmm. So I want to let's look at, I also want to um, show you some verses and discuss some different verses. So I put together this little document, which I'll upload later on. Um, well, first of all, of different, so I put together these different quotations um, from some sutras, from some commentaries on sutras, um, all related to training the mind. And meditating on the mind. So the first, let's just look at this verse of homage. I, I opened it. I prostrate to Gautama, Gautama Buddha, who through compassion. So that's referring to the Buddha's motivation. Right? So the Buddha's motivation for all of his teachings and all of his activities was compassion for sentient beings, wishing to free all sentient beings from suffering. So the Buddha, who motivated by a mind of great compassion, taught the, taught the exalted Dharma. So the Buddha taught um, the Dharma, or I mean, that's in Tibetan, it's actually Cho, it can also mean, um, can also mean the truth. Oh, let me see, what is the verse in Tibetan? Kangi Tushin is in Dawa Tanju, Dampe Dhani Dhanzeba, Dampe Dhani Dhanzeba. Actually, it, yeah, taught the exalted Dharma. It's also, you can also translate it as the Buddha taught the holy Tanpe Duni, the holy meaning, or the sacred meaning. So it basically refers to emptiness largely, but it can refer also more broadly to everything the Buddha taught. So why did the Buddha teach everything he taught? Because in order to free all sentient beings from suffering. Um, so for that reason, the Buddha taught you know, all of the Dharma, you know, the, four, the Four Noble Truths, um, to the eight, no, eight Four Noble Path, you know, Six Perfections and so forth. Um, but especially the view of emptiness, which, re which leads to the relinquishing of all views, right? So why did the Buddha teach the Dharma in order to free sentient beings from suffering? How does the Buddha free sentient beings from suffering? By teaching in such a way that they relinquish all views, so they abandon all wrong views, right? So this is indicating that the cause of all, all the suffering experience is due to um, wrong views that we have in our minds, right? So this again comes back to that the source of um, our suffering is actually mistaken concepts in our mind. And therefore, the way to actually um, achieve lasting happiness is to eliminate wrong concepts by generating correct concepts, wisdom, um, uh, and correct understanding, and then based on that, um, positive emotions. 
And then this, this second verse, um, the sages do not wash away sins with water. So this is how, how do the Buddhas, how do the Buddhas actually help us eliminate um, wrong views and bring about well-being and happiness? So the sages, this refers to all the Buddhas, the Buddhas do not wash away sins with water. They do not clear away being suffering with their hands. They do not transfer their own knowledge to others. They liberate by teaching the truth of reality. Right, so it's saying the Buddhas do not, yeah, it's, there's three different ways that they do not help us. And then the last way is the way that they actually do help us. Right? So the Buddhas do not wash away sins with water. So it's not that like the sins being, you know, our, our negative karma, our afflictive emotions, our disturbing emotions like anger, attachment, and then, um, you know, the karma we have from, from harming other sentient beings in this life and past lives. That the Buddhas, they don't, they don't just, um, it's not like the negative karma and afflictive emotions we have. It's like dirt on our clothes or dirt on our body that can be washed away with water by someone else, right? If it was, then the Buddhas would have already washed away. They would have already eliminated all of the causes of, of our suffering. They could have done that, but they can't do that, right? So they, they do not wash away sins with water. They do not clear away being sufferings uh, with their hands. So another way of interpreting this is that the Buddhas do not, they can't pull us out of samsara by the hand. It's not like they can physically like bring us, you know, from samsara. It's as if samsara is kind of a dreadful jungle full of snakes and tigers and poisonous plants. And that they could like kind of come into the jungle and then lead us out to a you know, beautiful alpine meadow full of flowers and, and sunlight or something. Um, so the Buddhas can't physically take us out of samsara to some other uh, beautiful place. Um, they can't sort of physically lift us or mentally lift us out um, directly, um, like clearing away being suffering with their hands. They do not transfer their own knowledge um, to others. So the Buddhas, although they've, um, um, they've achieved enlightenment, they can't just directly transfer their level of realization, the qualities of their mind into our minds. Otherwise, they would have again. So, how do they benefit sentient beings? They liberate by teaching the truth of reality. Right. So they te they teach us. Okay. Yeah. That's. Yeah. So I took that quotation from the Great Treatise on the Sages of the Path. Right. So that's. So how do they? How do the Buddhists benefit us? Is by. Um, yeah, by teaching, by explaining. So, I mean, one easy way to subsume everything that the Buddhas teach is to is into two classes, two categories: what to abandon and what to practice. Right? We can we can subsume all of the Buddhist teachings into two things: the things to be abandoned, right? Things that we should not do, like I mean, like the ten non-virtuous actions is the most obvious example: killing, stealing, um, sexual misconduct, um, and so forth. Um, because by engaging in those non-virtuous actions, we, we harm other sentient beings directly, um, and thereby we, we create causes for ourselves to be harmed. Right? So we create causes for our own suffering. So the Buddhists teach us all the different things to be abandoned, and then things to be adopted, or things to be trained in. Right? So there's a negative side, the causes of suffering to be abandoned, and then the positive side, the causes of happiness right, to be practiced. Um, so that's basically what the Buddha taught. And then there's this other famous um, uh, verse where the Buddha summarizes his own teaching, which I didn't put in the, I didn't uh, type it out. But it says, um, do not commit any non-virtuous action. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Perfect every virtue, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha, right? So here again, the Buddha, you know, in summarizing what he what he himself taught, he emphasizes this aspect of subduing the mind, of or transforming the mind. So he said, um, "Do not commit any unwholesome action or any negative action." Perfect every virtuous action. So that that's you know subsuming the Buddha's teachings and the things to be abandoned: every negative action, every unwholesome action, abandon it. And then perfect every virtuous action. So how do we do that? By subduing our own mind. Subduing our own mind is the third line. Um, this is the teaching of the Buddha. So, um, but the word I wanted to emphasize there, the word in that third line, the word subdue, it's usually translated, translated as subdue. 
It's um, Rangi Seni, Rangi Seni means do. Actually, in Tibetan, it's do. So do, that's the same word for Vinaya, actually. When we, you know, we talk about the three patakas, right? the three baskets of the Buddhist teachings, there's the Abhidharma, um, and the Sutra Pitaka, and then Okay, I'm back, my voice is back. Yeah, I was just saying, um, you have to remember I'm in uh, rural India. So sometimes the internet connection will be unstable, sometimes it might cut out, but usually I'll be back. If I'm ever not back for a long time, then try to meditate on what I was just talking about before that. <laughs> um, um, Oh, yes, yeah, so I was talking about the Vinaya. Uh, so in that third line of that, that verse, um, the Buddha says, when he's summarizing his own teaching, he says, subdue your own mind. But the, the word that's translated as subdue there can also, in short, it can also mean it's do, do. So that word, it cannot, the duwa is the Vinaya. So it can also mean, so the Vinaya Pitaka refers to all the, the rules and the kind of, um, all the advice for monks and ordained monks and nuns to, um, to follow. So it doesn't mean just subdue, like to conquer or um, put down or suppress, but it means it has more a sense of like to train in, through, a, through a process of self-discipline, right? So by disciplining oneself, according to one's understanding of what to be abandoned and what to practice, um, thereby one transforms one's behavior, or one trains one's behavior, one's, um, and you know, all of our behavior, our behavior, our physical behavior, our physical, our behaviors of speech all arise from um, from our mind. So um, yeah, so the, the Buddha basically in that third line uh, means to transform our own um, behavior by transforming our mind, by training our mind, by disciplining our mind according to our understanding, right? Our correct understanding of what are wholesome actions to engage in or what and what are unwholesome actions to be um, abandoned and given up. Um, let me just try to just try to mention a couple more. Um, so why is it important? A couple more points why it's important to um, and what's the purpose of meditating on the mind. Um, and then I want to open it up for questions. We're almost through the first hour. Um, so I'll give you a chance to ask questions in just a moment. Um, but some other ways why, um, yeah, so the first way is basically because we want happiness and we don't want suffering. And because we are the creators of our own reality. We create our own happiness and we create our own suffering through our own actions. Um, so one way we do that is in the immediate moment by, deter by directing our attention to either like the glass half empty or the glass half full by directing our attention to something negative that we don't like, we, in that very moment, we cause disturbance and, and unhappiness in our mind. In one very moment, by directing our attention to something that we do like, something, a positive aspect of ourselves or of another person or of a situation, we can create happiness in that very moment, right? So one, I mean, so in one way, we, from moment to moment, in the, in the present moment, we, you know, the way we direct our attention determines how we experience that moment, right? By directing our attention towards negative things or towards positive things, right? In, in, our, in our own kind of judgment. And also, I mean, then how we judge things, right? There might be something that we ordinarily perceive negative and neg as something negative, but 
because you know and so is something negative or positive from its own side no there's something things are negative and positive in our it's, it's an opinion it's a matter of opinion largely so in our value system right in our opinion or in our way of measuring things in our way of um, um, labeling things we label some things as negative and some things as positive so but we can relabel things if we think about something in a different way then we can reinterpret it and some things we think of as a negative light we can reinterpret it in a positive light so this is what lojong um, or mind training the whole buddhist genre of teachings of mind training is all about so for example take some, something like like something as simple as like a headache you know, physical pain a headache or a stomach ache some physical disease. Ordinarily, we consider that you know, something unpleasant, something we don't like. So if we sit and dwell and think about, you know, uh, or just our, just focus our attention on how bad our head hurts, like it just hurts worse, right? And we become more and more miserable. Um, but if we, you know, if we reinterpret that situation to think like, well, actually, you know, why am I having a headache? It's because I myself, um, cause some other sentient being to experience this kind of pain in the past, thereby created this karma. And this karma is now ripening as my having a headache. So how wonderful it is that I have this headache now because it's giving me the opportunity to recognize the negative actions I've created in the past. It's also causing the negative karma I, I've had I, that I created in the past to be exhausted. Um, also, this, you know, this suffering I'm experiencing now, this headache I'm experiencing now, it's reminding me something which I usually overlook from day to day, which is that, you know, of the 7 billion other, other human beings alone who, who you know, live on just planet Earth, that, that, you know, millions of them have this kind of painful headache every day. At any given time, there's millions of other sentient beings who are experiencing this kind of pain, this kind of suffering. And usually I don't take a moment to think about them. So by my experience in this sickness or this headache now, then I can, um, it gives me an opportunity to generate compassion and sympathy, empathy, compassion for countless other sentient beings who experience this all the time and who don't have the good fortune to have access to medicine or you know, friends or live in a interpret even a you know, situation which we ordinarily label as negative and we don't like. And thereby, you know, disturbs our mind. If we reinterpret it in a in a positive light, which is not to say that we're just making up kind of gobbledygook, kind of fantasy, you know, story about it. It's rather just looking at the reality of what what that object is, what the situation is, at a different aspect of the reality of the situation. Um, that 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 um, enables us to think about it in a very positive way. Then we can even transform how we experience the situation. So even a headache, of course, it doesn't make the physical pain go away, but it does make it um, less. And also instead of feeling, you know, um, self-pity, um, just feeling miserable in that experience, we can kind of bear that pain with uh, sort of courage um, and gratitude for that, you know, that challenge. Um, and gratitude for that that hardship. It's like um, you know, there's some kind of physical pain. You know, like I don't know. Uh, Zonsi, I think Zonsi Tensor Machine gave some nice examples of how, like, you know, if we um, some kind of you know aches and pain pains in our joints and muscles. Um, that if we have a if we get a fever and then we feel all kinds of aches and pains in our, in our muscles and joints, we feel kind of miserable about it. But if we go to the gym and we really push, you know, we push ourselves to, uh, you know, work out all these different muscle groups and kind of lift heavy weights or, you know, push our endurance to its to its nth degree or, you know, go long distance running or something, then we feel very simple, very similar pain in our joints and muscles. But at that time, we feel really happy about it because it's something that we're voluntarily doing and we see it as part of, you know, a long, a, a, a more broad project of achieving like. A better state of health for ourselves, um, <clears throat> or like I know with sometimes I, I myself do like fasting, you know, water fasting for a couple of days. So sometimes you know, it, like if I um, if I'm not fasting and I'm just like you know really busy and don't have time to eat for you know for half a day or something, 
and I start to feel really hungry and thirsty. I kind of feel miserable about, miserable about it. But one of the really helpful techniques of fasting is when you are fasting and you feel the same kind of hunger and um, maybe thirst and you know other kind of you know, weakness or headaches that go with it. But you think to yourself, well, you know, because I'm fasting, like this is really good. Like I'm expelling toxins. I'm like becoming healthier, right? So you can you can feel quite happy about all this, the the um, yeah the kind of discomfort of hunger and, and weakness um, in that situation because you reinterpret the situation. So that's another way how you know by we can learn to use our minds to reinterpret a situation, any situation actually, so that um, actually it's a, it's, a, it's a cause for, um, for joy, for happiness. And so that's another reason it's important to uh, meditate on the mind is to see how actually the mind on the one hand, the mind is a creator of our experience, right? We create our experience according according to on one hand how we direct our attention on the other hand the quality of attention we give um you know a very focused attention versus a very scattered attention and on the other hand we create you know each moment of experience according to how we interpret situations right um and then yeah just to throw out a few more things before i um open the floor up for questions well, another important aspect of you know, why it's important to look at the mind is in a broader way to understand what we are as a person. You know, without really understanding what the mind is and different, some of the fundamental qualities of our mind, we, we, don't really, we cannot really understand what we are as a person. Um, one way to think about that is because, um, well, I mean, one way to think about it is just because, I mean, think about, you know, someone who maybe, so I was trying to imagine some kind of example. Think about someone, maybe you play on a sports team or you played on a sports team in the past. And so some other person, like a teammate, someone you played with sports with, or maybe someone who works out at the same gym you work out at, or someone you, you know, who sees you regularly around your neighborhood, someone who kind of has some familiarity with your physical being, right? Your body and how your, you know, how your body is, how you appear, um, uh, maybe how you smell, how you move, how you how you walk, um, different things you do with your body. You know, so you, so when we when we play sports with someone else, we you know we with other people, we um, because we're doing this physical activity together. Any physical activity we do with other people, we're familiar with kind of you know some aspects of their body. And imagine another person. So imagine this, there's this person who has some understanding of your physical you know, your physical body, how you're physical, physically how you exist, right? Um, and then imagine another person who's never seen you, never seen a picture of you, but maybe through, you know, conversing or talking or exchanging messages or emails over a long time, they have uh, some, or reading, maybe reading things you've written or um, so forth. They have an understanding of your mind and your opinions and your thoughts, right? So imagine one person who has an understanding Pretty decent understanding of your physicality, your body. Another person, but they don't know anything about your mind, right? <laughs> Imagine another person who knows a lot about your mind, but they don't know anything about your body, right? Which person do you feel like knows you better? Most people, I think we'd say the person who has some understanding of our mind, they know us better, right? The person with some, some understanding of our body, they don't really know us better. Anyway, it's an interesting question. Um, so in one hand, I think for most of us, we'll feel like what's more essential to us as a person um, is our mind, is our thoughts, our feelings, our opinions, our, our memories, um, the way, you know, mentally how we experience different situations um, is more important than, you know, anything about our body. Um, um, and yet, you know, we, you know, like, well, I don't know, maybe these days it's different, but when I was going to school, like we have, oh God, we have this for years, you know, in um, grade school and high school, we have required, you know, health, physical education class, but there's no like, um, you know, where you, they teach, you know, we have, sometimes we learn about how to play different sports, but oftentimes there's a class, classroom element where you learn about, you know, all the systems of the body, your digestive system and your uh, circulatory system and your, skeletal system and so forth, all the different parts of the body. 
but I don't remember any class about like health, uh, mental health education, right? There's a lot about physical health education, but not much about mental health education. These days, I don't know, it might be different, but this is definitely something that's holding us Dalai Lama's promoting all the time. Actually, that reminds me of a point I wanted to make earlier. Of, I was saying that I want to convince you that um, it's important to meditate on our mind in order to um, bring about uh, happiness and eliminate suffering in your own experience. And that, that might seem trivial, but one thing I was thinking about while we were pre while preparing for this session was how um, I know, well, from I think most of you, in, not most of you, I should say, I mean, I'm from, uh, I'm from the United States, right? From, so from a Western culture background, I know many people in the course also from Western culture background. So this observation maybe is quite different for people from the Western culture and people from uh, Indian culture or Asian culture background. But I know in the West, like you think about what have been the world, the, the dominant world views in our culture for the last, uh, well, 2000 years, right? Since the advent of Christianity. Um, is, is, is kind of a worldview that seems to indicate that actually happiness doesn't come from ourself, but happiness comes from other, right? So how so? Um, well, in a Christian worldview, right? Um, as with most theistic religions, there's the idea that the, the world and all the inhabitants of the world are created by God, right? Our creations of our creator God, right? So, um, so, and the Abrahamic God is generally, of course, many people have different ideas about what God is, um, but generally the Abrahamic God is considered like all powerful, you know, omnipotent, all loving, true, but, um, and merciful, but, but ultimately is the source of everything, that God created everything. Um, and so God created you know, Adam and Eve, and God created, so God created the human race and all the creatures that inhabit the earth. So even though we might not be Christian, right? Still a lot of our, it's just there's that, that kind of Christian worldview, which was the dominant worldview until the scientific enlightenment in Europe, just like 250, 300 years ago, right? So still that, that kind of worldview affects many, many, many um, things. And so it does affect that kind of the way we look at ourselves. So how does it affect the way we look at ourselves? Is that, you know, we feel like we are a powerless entity in this you know, vast uh, world, which we didn't create. It's like, we're just a happenstance. Um, so the, a God created this kind of vast world. And then in order to be happy, we have to kind of learn the will of God, right? So I'm not, I know, you know whether, whether we're Christian or not, or you know, have ever been, I think this, this kind of world you still affects our thinking is that there's this idea that this world was created by a creator God, and so to be happy, to find out how to be happy in this world, doesn't, it doesn't, we don't have to look within to find the source of happiness. Rather, we have to look out to see what, you know, what is the will of God? What is the intention of that God? And how do, what are the principles according to which the God created the universe? Or the principles according to which this universe works? And so how do I have to figure out how to, how to kind of, um, as kind of like find my way through this maze? Right. Um, try to manipulate the external world or live in, in accordance with the external world to kind of bring about conditions uh, for my happiness. Um, so there's a sense that my happiness doesn't come from within. There's not a source of happiness within, but rather happiness comes from without. It's either like it comes about through the grace of God, right? Or, or it comes about um, through um, kind of well, that yeah, basically it comes down to that. It kind of comes about through the grace of God, God, through aligning my actions in accordance with the will of God. So that's always pleasing to God. So that's one aspect of the largely Western worldview. But then, you know, since the scientific revolution, like 300 years ago, that 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 kind of Christian worldview faded. But what took its place is this kind of materialistic worldview, material worldview, whereas the world is seen as something that is fundamentally physical, right? Not mental. And so what does that mean if the world is fundamentally physical? It means, again, that, that, that as um, people who are, well, as a sentient being, that means that our mind is not very important, right? 
physical stuff is important. So if we get, if we if we manipulate the external environment so that we have, you know, we have our rooms, our, our houses at the right temperature, if we have enough food, if we have enough water, if we have clothes that clothes that are comfortable, if we have medicines that prevent us from being infected with diseases, um, and that you know that 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 can numb you know physical pain when we have no physical pain. If we can do all these different physical things to manipulate our external physical environment and manipulate our bodies, right, by exercising, eating the right food, and so forth, then we'll have happiness, right? Because fundamentally, the world is a physical thing. The most fundamental building blocks of the world are atoms and, and uh, molecules, and, uh, so forth. So if we can figure out how to manipulate all that physical stuff in just the right way, then everything will be okay. We'll be happy. So even though we might not we might not believe that when we kind of think about it, in the background that sort of worldview is there. I think for most of us. I know. I mean, speaking of my own personal experience, I know when I when I first learned about um, uh, Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, yeah, you know, that that gradually became kind of clear to me that man, that this is a radically the Buddhist worldview that like ultimately <clears throat> actually sentient beings themselves, that I create my own world, that this whole world that I live in, of course, it's not the I create you, it's not like I create the earth I walk on, but my experience of all those things are creations of me. Like my own personal experience is something I'm responsible for. And that includes how other people treat me and the kind of, you know, and whether I get sick or not, whether I have good fortune or misfortune, whether I have luck or bad luck, all of that comes back to my own karma, right? Um, so that's an incredibly empowering kind of worldview versus, you know, so when we compare this, uh, this theistic worldview with the world, the, the world's created by a uh, uh, creator God, whom we have no, we have no power, over, we have no effect over. So there we're totally, it's like we're almost helpless. And then if the world is a material thing, you know, it just works according to all these physical principles, which we have no power over. It's also kind of like we're largely helpless, right? Um, you know, the Big Bang happened, evolution happened, we're just a happenstance. You know, we, we're here for a while, gradually, eventually we're gonna die and we'll be gone and then that's all, it's over. So there's not much room really for us to, to do much, right? But so, um, so we're kind of a, a largely helpless kind of thing in the materialistic world. The creative force and the Hello, Venerable's uh, audio will resume. Not to worry, just uh, keep thinking about what you were saying. Please bear with us. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. Um, as groups, I was saying, as groups of sentient beings, we do create whole world systems, right? So a whole world system is, is actually a product of the karma, the collective karma of all the sentient beings who inhabit that world system. Um, 
Um, okay, and then just one, I mean, one last thing. So why, I mean, it's important to meditate on the, the nature of the mind in order to understand what we are as a person. Also be Mm -hmm. I'm experiencing the wrath of forces that are outside of my control. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I was saying, uh, yeah, this theistic worldview or materialist worldview, they both kind of tell us that we, what we are as a person is something that we have not created. It's been created by forces that are outside of our control. Whereas the Buddhist view um, is that what we are as a person is something that we have created, which means we have the power to change what we are as a person over time. We can, we, it's what we are as a person is completely in our own hands, right? um, which is extremely empowering um, um, an extremely positive um, view, I think. Um, and it opens up just a vast amount of possibilities. I mean, the possibility for enlightenment, which is not there otherwise. So, um, and then, a, and a big part of that is that we have time, right? Um, we have time on our side, which means because, um, yeah, again, in the Christian or theistic worldview, generally, well, it, I mean, it varies a little bit, but generally we only have this life um, and we either get it right or we don't. And then, you know, we, we face judgment and, you know, game over. Or in a materialistic view, even worse. Like we definitely only have this life, and there's nothing beyond um, with the death of our, our physical body. So, of course, I mean, I'm sure you all know that um, Buddhists uh, assert the existence of infinite past lives and also infinite future lives up to enlightenment, and that all is the reasoning establishing that is primarily due with the mind, right? Because what looking at what is the what is the substantial cause for any moment of mind is necessarily a previous moment of mind. So it's by looking at the mind that we establish that there's existence of past and future lives. And, there, and thereby we establish the possibility of, you know, gradual transformation over a long time. So it means that even, you know, we can make mistakes again and again and again, and we'll always have another chance. <laughs> and, you know, even if we we feel like we're on the right track, we're going in a positive direction, but we don't see things happening. We don't see ourselves changing as fast as we'd like to. That's okay. The main thing is just keep going in the right direction. And, you know, just as drop, you know, drop by drop, you know, one drop at a time, a great, you know, a great container is filled. Gradually, you know, by doing, by making one, you know, small incremental positive transformation at a time, gradually we become fully, fully right. Like there's no question. So that, that also, that reason all has to do with understanding the nature of the mind. And then, so of course, the possibility of enlightenment has to do with understanding the nature of the mind. Okay, so I'll stop talking there and give you a chance to ask questions. And we'll check the chat box. Oh, my chat box has totally been erased because I, it was cut off. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, you can raise your hand, you can raise your virtual hand or type a, or yeah, you can raise your live hand. So, your flesh and blood hand. Okay, Case. Uh, good morning. And first morning. of all, thank you very much for mm -hmm. this wonderful teaching. 
Uh, I'm gonna keep the question brief. I'm a Dzogchen beginner, so I have multitude of, of things that I would like to ask, but I think the answers are gonna come uh, bit by bit these days. Uh, what I would like to ask is the way when you formulate, when you say I created bad karma in the past, isn't that stating a, a state of duality that, that I as a person has, I have not exist, existed before and I really don't exist right now. What is actually happening is the experience of the, of the, of the action which has is passing through this present moment and and it's not really connected to me as a as a person because it's it's a it's a i mean it's a grammatic question maybe but it's always something which has been waking a question within me why do we always say i created bad karma in the past okay yeah good question um well first of all what we are as a person i mean you're saying like we, we're just um, a kind of a collection of events of phenomena that are happening in the present moment and the, there is no person um but actually what we are as a person is we're, we're something there it's true there is a there is a collection of events happening in the moment the physical events of our body and then all the mental events of our mind and that collection is not us right that's because our body is our body, is my body, or my mind, our mind is our mind. So, but, but there is a possessor of our body, there's a possessor of our mind. So what that, that, that possessor is something that's merely imputed upon the collection. So imagine this is like the collection of my five aggregates, right? So five fingers, the collection of five aggregates. And then the person is that which is, we impute upon that collection, we impute I. And thereby, I exist. Thereby, the person does exist. The person doesn't exist in any more substantial way than that, but the person does exist in that way, right? So there, there is an I. But then, um, but then there's another question. When we say I created like negative karma in the past, um, especially if we if we feel like we've been a very good person this life. Like this person, this life, we haven't created any negative karma. So who is this person that created all this negative karma, which is why I have headaches and misfortune and bad luck and stuff, right? Well, well, actually, you, we can, you know, just like, let's see. Well, let's see, like, look at, uh, this is my favorite example. In all my talks, I use this, this mug, right? It's my kind of my prop, my main prop. So we can think about this mug, right? This mug. There's a mug, this mug that exists in the present moment, right, is the one that you can see. But this, this mug that has been sitting on my desk since this morning and will be sitting there hopefully still tonight, you cannot see the beginning or the end of that one. That one, you can't see all of it, right? So, but I mean, it's the same mug, but it's just talking about it, characterizing it in two different ways as something existing in the present moment or as something that's existed over a longer duration of time. So as a person, like we exist in the present moment, but did we only exist in the present moment? No, you know, we, we've all existed for some years. I mean, I can see we've all existed for some years in the past. There's no one yet, less than one year old here. <laughs> and, and hopefully we'll exist for many years in the future, right? So, but, 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 but how can we be both those people? Isn't that two different people? One that exists in the present and one that has existed since years, you know, since many years ago and exists in the present now. Well, it's not two different people. It's just two different ways of characterizing the same person, right? But, but usually we only think about us as a person in regard to this life, like, right? So this, see, I, and this is most, most humans, I think you can say, most people, we have the sense that what we are as a person is confined just to this life. Right? And this is really something that meditating on the nature of the mind helps to break that down, right? Helps to change that view of what we are as a person, right? Because is it, is it really the case that what we are as a person is confined to this life? Um, 
Well, in short, no. Right? So, I mean, I'll just give you the typical Buddhist view first, and then if you have more questions about it or you want to you know, challenge that, you're all welcome to do so. And we'll try to go into more detail in it. But in short, we can, just as we can characterize like a person that exists right now in the present moment versus us, the person who has existed over several years, over many years, we can also characterize a person that we, the person that we are who exists in this life versus the person that we are who has existed over all past lives and will exist over all future lives. Right? There's also that kind of person. So according to the Buddhist view, the person that we are actually is a continuum of, like I was saying before, it's like a river flowing through time. Right? So we can experience in the present moment, we're continually changing. Just like a, if we look at a river, like right now, we can see the water moving, it's continually changing. And when did that river begin? You know, it's hard to say, but, um, um, but if we look it over, you know, we come back again and again to the same river, we can see, you know, like Heraclitus said, we're never stepping into the same river twice. We can, we can see it's changing continually over, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year. Um, but um, as a, so as a person, you know, we can say, well, the continuum of the person of this life, when did it begin? At the moment of conception, right? When, when the sperm and egg cells, cells of our parents came together. And then, I mean, according to Buddhism, see, here's the key thing. Also a stream of consciousness had to conjoin with those physical cells to create a person. If there's, because those physical cells, the sperm and egg cell of our parents, they do not, they're physical things. They're exclusively physical things, they're cells, right? They don't have, they don't possess consciousness. And so they don't have the ability to, to produce consciousness, right? So that the first moment of consciousness at the moment of conception had to have a different cause, which is, which you have to have posit, you have to posit as a stream of consciousness that pre-existed that moment of conception. Therefore, there has to have been a stream of consciousness that can join with those sperm and egg cells. Just like at the time of death, you know, the physical body dies, but there's a stream of consciousness that separates from the body and goes on. So, so, that, so then that stream of consciousness, which goes from life to life, is more fundamentally the basis for imputing the person than the, the physical body, right? And um, because that stream of consciousness goes from life to life, then the person goes from life to life. So therefore, as a person, we're not something that's actually confined to just this life. We identify as a person that's confined to just this life because we identify strongly with this body of this life, right? But, it, but so that's one, one purpose of meditating on the nature of the mind is to change the, the, the emphasis of our identification from identifying with our physical body to identifying with our mental um, constituents, you could say, our mental body, you could say, but our mental constituents. So if we can identify more strongly with our mind and then we see more that what our mind is, is something that's not confined to this life, then gradually we, we learn to recognize and identify clearly as something that's a person that's not confined to this life. This life is just like staying in a hotel for a few days, right? And then at death, we check out and we go to another hotel. And then we go to another hotel, and then we go to another hotel. And then we can sleep there. Okay, other questions? Okay, someone in the chat. Oh, my question is about, so this question is from the chat. I mean, you can all open up the chat box and read it if you like also. Yeah, I'll read it out, so I'll read. Okay, my question is re regarding the term happiness, which is quite present all over the Dharma teachings. Isn't something related to a state of duality? Huh, this is also another duality question. Isn't, something, isn't it something related to a state of duality? I think that we are maybe looking for equanimity, balance, instead of happiness, joy. I would like to learn your view on this topic. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. Yeah, it's very controversial. Um, and I don't know, controversial is maybe the wrong word, but it's a little, um, yeah, it can lead to a lot of misconceptions. This idea of, you know, always looking for happiness. All sentient beings are looking for happiness, but we want happiness. Um, yeah, so isn't it related to, yeah, it is kind of, 
we can be very dualistic about our notion of like happiness and well-being. That's why I usually throw in the kind of happiness and well-being um, to try to balance it out a bit. But but what we mean is, um, well, there, there's no question there's all different kinds of happiness. You know, if, if we ask ourselves, well, what is happiness? It's very difficult to define because there's so many different kinds of happiness. I mean, generally, generally happiness, I mean, think for yourself, like how, how would you characterize, I mean, what is happiness? Why don't we do a little, we do a little exercise together first. Why don't you all type in the chat what you think happiness is in just a couple words, right? Before I just spout my own kind of views, you type in the chats, like, what do you think happiness is essentially? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Joy, delight, yeah. A peace of mind, yeah. Definitely, does that kind of element contentment with what? Okay, that's interesting. Interconnectedness. A combination of joy, well-being, and inner peace. Okay, contentment. Okay, none of you are saying like chocolate. Um, you know, a beautiful sunset. Mental good feeling. Okay, mental good feeling, a sense of lightness. Okay, so when you're in a, uh, what is it, gravity, like, like free falling in an airplane, you might feel happy. A long-lasting pleasant feeling, including, okay. Knowing that everyone around me is happy, okay, that's nice. Peace of mind, not having disturbing thought constantly, yeah. But if you're not having disturbing thought, then if you're in deep sleep, you would be happy, right? Fleeting contentment, okay. So happiness isn't necessarily fleeting. Peace and silence, okay, chocolate. I think Paul's just being a teacher pleaser. <laughs> Unity with others, um, deep meditation, okay. Yeah, okay, all great. Yeah, so I think most of you, it looks like most of you are, are really kind of aiming for the long-term happiness, right? Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so one, I mean, one initial way to, to look at uh, different ways of different kinds of happiness is long-term kind of sense of well-being or underlying sense of joy versus short-term pleasure. You know, like when we, um, you know, when we, we hear an, a funny joke and we're laughing or, um, you know, we see a sunset or we taste some delicious food and it just tastes really good in that moment. You know, those are all kind of short-lived uh, enjoyment and pleasure. And that, that's one kind of, you know, some one kind of happiness is very short-term um, happiness or even, uh, you know, a moment of peace. You know, sometimes we just, I don't know, maybe like struggling to hike up a mountain or something and some, some, suddenly we come and we see this vast vista for a, you know, a few moments, we just feel totally at peace. Yeah, it's another kind of you know, fairly short-term um, happiness. So this kind of short-term happiness versus long-term happiness. Um, so it's true that like, you know, if we have a long lasting sense of peace, that maybe comes about with a sense of satisfaction about who we are or what we are as a person or the way we're lead leading our life. Um, or maybe like, you know, in our old age, when we look back at our life and we feel very happy to see, you know, how we've used our life, that we used our life well, and we have a kind of long lasting sense of satisfaction. Or maybe, you know, we have just very, um, very satisfying relationships with our spouse or siblings or family or friends that, um, or we're engaged in work that we feel is really, really worthwhile. So there's other kinds of you know, things that bring more long lasting sense of uh, satisfaction. So those are, yeah, that's a different kind of uh, long lasting happiness. Um, so definitely, I mean, when, when we're talking about happiness uh, in Buddhism that we all sentient beings want happiness, we're referring to both, you know, that we want short-term happiness, um, but, but long lasting happiness, long-term happiness is more important, right? Um, because, and yeah, um, well, because it's, because it's more reliable, it's more stable. So ultimately, I mean, there's a big question um, that I think Alexandra's question kind of refers to is, is it, I mean, it's kind of in the background there. 
is is it really is it well one is it really hap is it really possible to be like continually happy to be you know continually in a state of like well-being or joy or satisfaction and even if it's possible is it even desirable like you know because it is definitely it's a it's a good question like well for example because of this if you know if there was no if there was no night time like if the sun never set imagine the earth well i don't know how how you do it Imagine the Earth was the center of the universe and it was orbited by two suns. Right? So, so there's never any part of the, the Earth that's not illuminated, right? So imagine it was there was always the same amount of illumination kind of all the time. Would there be any night in that kind of planet, in that kind of world? I mean, sorry, there would be no night, right? Because night means when the sun sets, right? So because there'd no because there'd be no night, would there be any day? You know, would there be such a thing as daytime in that universe where there's just continual illumination? Probably not. I would say it seems like you know, day is something that exists in, in relation to a night. Right? A night exists in relation to day. You know, just like east exists in relation to west. Like you can't there over there exist in relation to here. Long, you know, is 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 um. I don't know, is my pen, this pen, is it long or short? Well, you know, compared to, I don't know, I have to find something short here. Compared to this bottle, maybe it's short. I mean, it's long, right? But compared to, I don't know, my, my laptop, it's short, right? So if something's long or short, it, the question you can only answer in relation to other things. So in one way, like imagine a universe where nobody, there is no suffering, like nobody's, Nobody's ever sad, nobody's lonely, nobody has hunger or thirst or loneliness or confusion. Like everybody's just totally content and you know, kind of in a state of flourishing and joy like all the time. In that universe, is there any happiness actually? <laughs> you know, isn't it the case that happiness exists in relation to, to suffering? Um, you know, because one, one reason we feel happy when we feel happy is because we, you know, we've we've suffered, right? Because we've been in states where we didn't feel happy, and we know how bad that feels, right? And it's in a way, it's like only that experience that really allows us to appreciate what it is to to really feel happy. Right? It's kind of like life, life and death. You know, until when we you know when we're when we're children, or even when we're adolescents. I mean, we can probably all remember a time when we, we didn't know anyone who died or we didn't really understand what it was um, for a person to die, right? But then at some, you know, at some point in, in growing up and maturing, we, you know, someone close to us dies or we ourselves maybe have a brush with death. And then we realize like, oh, you know, this thing that we took for granted before, of being alive, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a permanent state. It's not something that will always be the case. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's, not, um, it's not guaranteed that tomorrow will come for us or tomorrow will come in our relationships with our parents, our friend, um, and so forth, right? So, so it's, and it's that recognition of death you know, that eventually this life comes to an end, which really makes life kind of beautiful, in a way, which gives life its its um, value and makes it seem really precious uh, to us, right? So, yeah, so is it really, yeah, so that, is it really like even, I mean, many people have the question and it's a very, it's a totally legitimate question, so I'm saying, is it really even um, desirable to strive for a state of continual happiness where we're always happy, right, and joyful and content? Um, well, I think, yeah, we have to add a lot of nuance to, I mean, and, and there's no question that in Buddhism, it is a goal right? to enlightenment is envisioned as a state of perfect happiness, right? So, but to, to really make that be something that makes sense and is kind of meaningful, um, we have to add quite a lot of nuance and interpretation to that. So. Um, 
Well, usually, I mean, I think the first thing we have to change about the way we approach the question is usually when we think about happiness, our own happiness, we're, we're automatically thinking about our own happiness, like what I want. I mean, happiness kind of means like getting kind of what I want, things being the way I want them to. Not necessarily, I mean, I know that's kind of shallow, but um, so when we think about, you know, in that way, if we were to think about enlightenment, it would be like enlightenment, the way we interpret enlightenment would be like a state in which we always get what we want, right? Which, yeah, that is pretty boring, I think. Um, or, you know, a state in which just everything is just the way we want it to be. Um, which is not, and, 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 and it still has a, a, a sense of selfishness to it, right? Um, so, whereas enlightenment is not that at all. I mean, actually, enlightenment is totally, um, it's not selfish at all. It's the opposite of that. It's totally altruistic, right? So I think that's the reason actually. So the kind of happiness that we envision, you know, that uh, when a person's enlightened, that they experience continual happiness, I think it's, it's, it's quite different than what we think of happiness because it's totally altruistic. And for the most part, we have a hard time really imagining what it is like to be uh, totally altruistic. Okay. So, I mean, I think, I think the best way we, to imagine like what the kind of happiness when we talk about you know, achieving a state of lasting happiness of enlightenment, the best way to try to imagine what that would be like would be to try to imagine moments in our own experience in our own life when we've really been exclusively concerned about the welfare of others. Right? So think about like, I don't know. I mean, probably for those of you who've been parents, you probably have a much easier time. I'm, I'm, I've never had children myself, but I think parents feel that in certain moments, probably many moments, where they're really, their concern is exclusively for their, their children. And that, you know, that's a kind of a love, a kind of caring about their children, which, um, I mean, I've heard from many, from my own parents, from you know, grandparents, from my, my sister and her husband, that, that's a kind of joy that um, um, that um, that they only have independence upon having children. So, and I think I mean it's often described in Buddhist scriptures that you know the, the kind of when we generate the kind of concern we try to generate for other sentient beings is supposed to be that of a, like a mother for her only child, like a very loving mother for her only child, right? So that definitely is one of the main examples used as a kind of, when we talk about compassion and concern for another person, the, the concern that a very loving parent has um, for the, their children. Um, so it's, so by that we can kind of interpret that, yeah, in an ordinary person's experience, that probably is one of the most closest kinds of the most selfless um, love or concern for someone else. Um, that we can experience, right? So that, um, so then think about, and but then, you know, so then we try to extrapolate from there, right? expand from there to think about, um, well, what if we had that kind of concern for every single sentient being, by like not only for our own, you know, actual physical child, but we have this kind of total selfless concern for every sentient being, right? So there's no, <clears throat> there's, there's no room for selflessness at all. And because actually selfishness, it's a self-centered concern, which gives rise to attachment, wanting some things, and aversion, not wanting other things. And it's those two attitudes, grasping at things we want, and then not getting that disturbs our mind. Being averse to other things that we don't want, and then that happens to us anyway, and being upset, that disturbs our mind. So one is, you know, if we have no selfish concern, then there's no room for the mind to be disturbed by this grasping and aversion, right? So there automatically is peace, right? Because we don't care what happens to us, right? It doesn't matter to us. So there's automatically a kind of peace um, that comes from not having any selfish concern. So that's the basis. And then on, on top of that, having this incredible concern for others, you know? Um, I think being concerned about others brings its own joy. Right? Loving others is one of the richest sources of joy we can have. 
So, um, so the, so then I think, I don't know, to me, it, it kind of starts to make sense how, and it's not that, and just as we saw in some of the verses we're just looking at, it's not that because we have, if we were, if we're enlightened and we have this total elimination of selfish concern and total, you know, what we are is altruism, basically. We have this, this um, complete full development of, um, other-centered concern, or concern for others. And it's incredible love and, and compassion for other sentient beings, incredible concern for other sentient beings. That doesn't mean that, you know, everything that what we want, that, that things happen the way we want them to, right? Um, um, that still, I mean, still the kind of the world goes on kind of as it is. And I think there's a lot of, there's still a lot of diversity and, you know, richness of you know different kinds of experiences right? so don't think it becomes boring and sort of static um but i think the way a person experiences it is as awe-inspired um yeah so that's the kind of i mean when you think about uh yeah the kind of happiness yeah and basically they're aiming for in buddhism i know this has become a very long answer to your question but is sort of long-term um, stable sources of happiness. And so look at, and, and those which arise out of positive emotions, right? So think of the kind of well-being and happiness which arises from love, uh, compassion, altruistic concern for others, gratitude. Um, and also the kind of, which I haven't mentioned is a kind of happiness that, that um, arises from being a good person, right? From satisfaction with, with what we are as a person, which means that we feel like we're living our lives in a way that is in harmony with the truth, with the truth of, you know, the, as we understand it. So there's a kind of happiness that comes from wisdom, from feeling like we, we understand things uh, in the way they actually are, right? Um, so that's a, another um, big source of happiness. So, yeah. Those are the kind of the ones that are in for. All right. Um. Again, I have a question. Sure. Is that Dipti? I don't see or hear. Who is that? Again, a lot of my. Right. Yeah. What's your question? <laughs> yeah, like this is D here. I see, I see, yeah, go, go for it. Okay. A lot of people uh, um, that I work with and people who are uh, right now in uh, this whole COVID situation uh, say that they're extremely fearful and uh, that they're going through, uh, you know, great pangs of fear, maybe about their future and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. What is fear according to Buddhism? What is and fear? what is because it's not um, it's not um, how does one define fear in Buddhism because this is very gripping they uh, sometimes say we are paralyzed with fear what according to you is fear and I mean what is like an antidote for it yeah very good question and not easy one yeah because you're right it's not like readily defined I haven't seen uh, you know I don't think I've ever seen a definition for fear I mean the scriptures or even heard in a teaching. Um, so, I mean, you know, usually when we don't know, like have a ready hand definition for something, a good place to start is just look for different instances of fear and then try to see what, well, why, why do we call all of those different instances fear? What is common among them? So, what are some of the kind of fears you're you're hearing from people that you're in touch with? Dee? Hello, Dee -dee. Unmute yourself, Deepti. Uh, Genla, basically, um, right now, though it concerns, uh, you know, work for most of them, and that mm -hmm. they're scared of losing 
their employment and they may be you know without a job it could be something like that to some people who feel that um, you know their position may be altered at work but it's so gripping that some of them end up crying or being breathless so yeah yeah okay it, um yeah so yeah so there can be fear of like um well um yeah i mean definitely fear is a is a well there's well first of all there's two different kinds of fear right fear is not necessarily a negative thing because there's wholesome there's wholesome fear and then there's kind of crippling crippling or uh, disturbing fear you know there's fear which is a disturbing emotion which is what you're talking mm -hmm. about but then there's also a kind of wholesome fear um you know like like in the definition of refuge um one of the the one of the causes for going for refuge in the buddha dharma sangha is having a fear of um you know after death falling into the suffering of the lower realms or having you know a fear of the suffering of samsara so you know like well it's kind of like this like now during this COVID-19 pandemic you know we know there's a there's a lot of people around who are affected with COVID-19 so when we go out in public places or go to a friend's house or you know anyone we meet basically uh, um, then there's a possibility that they have they unknowingly or unknowingly have COVID-19 and that by being in contact with them we could get that you know we could become infected and then if we become infected because i don't know how something like two out of every hundred people who get infected they they die of, of it mm -hmm. so um you know so there's a fear that we have of and then in a way did we might come home and then infect you know other people we live with our parents our children and so forth so there's a kind of fear that we have i mean it just did not just in, in in that example we can look at two different kinds of fear there can be the kind of fear when when we go out thinking oh no they might have it you know i have to stay away from them and it kind of disturbs our mind but there's also it's the very it's a kind of related fear that just it's just like a wise recognition that when they go out other people might be infected so i have to do what i can to not get infected i have to wear a mask you know stay stay distance from other people not be in a closed space if not necessary um, wash my hands and so forth when I come home. So it's, you know, on the one hand, this kind of uh, fear of being infected, it can just lead us into like panic and maybe aversion and, you know, a lot of complaining um, and just kind of crippling. It can be crippling uh, for us. Um, but on the other hand, it's the recognition of the same danger can, can lead us to have sort of a wholesome fear which is just a recognition of harm that, I mean, a realistic recognition of harm that could come to us or could, could come about to others. And therefore, you know, we need to do what we can to reduce the possibility of that harm coming about you know, as much as we can, right? So that's a kind of wise fear. Um, mm -hmm. But you're talking about the, the sort of the destructive emotion of fear. Yeah. So I think, yeah. So basically it's by, you know, recognizing different, I mean, it's basically thinking about different kinds of harm that could come about to us or misfortune to us or to others. And then yeah. Um, and then, yeah, but then, in, but, and then dwelling on that possibility. So it can help to, I mean, that's why it can help to think about what we're afraid of to help. It doesn't have to sort of get below the fear to look what is the cause because the fear is an emotion. It's an emotional response. You know, when we look at a certain kind of situation, but the cause for that response is seeing a certain kind of situation, right? So if we look to what is the cause of the fear, like you're saying, say, uh, you know, some people, uh, you know, or um, they have a certain job and they're afraid that they'll lose the job right? or they'll get demoted. And then, won't, and then, you know, as a consequence, won't be able to pay the rent. Maybe we'll have to move. We'll have to, you know, accept, you know, a charity or ask others for help, um, and so forth. <clears throat> so it can help by looking at 
Um, I think when we talk when we talk about an antidote, <clears throat> I mean, as with most most antidotes, the thing is to try to when we feel the disturbance. Of, I mean, the disturbing emotion arise in the mind. First of all, to just look honestly at what we're experiencing. Don't try to distract ourselves. Don't try to just brush it away or minimize it, but to honestly look at the way our mind is being disturbed, right? And accept that you know that's okay on the one hand and, and try to think, okay, but now I'm gonna, you know, I have to try to do the best I can in this situation and try to look objectively at, you know, first of all, the emotional situation that we're in with compassion and then, and then try to look at the causes that, that gave rise to that emotional state, right? <clears throat> and then see if there's any other, are there other ways we can think about or engage with those causes that gave rise to the disturbing emotions. So in this case, is there any, you know, we see the situation that we're in that, you know, maybe our workplace is shut down, we might get laid off. And if I do this, this is gonna happen. So one way to react to that with, is with fear and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does undermine our ability to, <clears throat> to do anything constructive in that moment. So first of all, we wanna look at the fear you know, with compassion for ourselves, and then try to think about well, what what is causing me to have this fear? Um, okay, it's it is the case that this is this pandemic. I might get laid off. So if the, if that's possible, is there anything I can do rather than reacting with fear? Looking at well, what what are the things that are in our control? One is, you know, panicking is is going to make it worse, right? So is there anything I can do to reduce the chance that I get laid off? One thing. Another thing, is there any kind of contingency plan? Can I make some kind of contingency plan? So if I do get laid off, well, what would I do? You know, what, what are the other, is there, is there another, are there other ways that I might be able to gain an income? Maybe there's, is there even ways before I get laid off now, is there anything I can do to maybe, you know, create some other income stream? Is there anything I can do to reduce my living costs so that if I do get laid off that I can live for longer on, you know, what I have? what savings I already have. Um, so, you know, so to rather than react with fear to kind of try to use that concern about harm that might come to us to, to do whatever we can to um, reduce the likelihood that, you know, that harm will come is one thing. Can I Thank ask you, Daniel. One thing. Hey, I, 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 have, I have a big fear about is it's uh, Kevin. Kevin, Kevin Wayne, yes. Kevin, I'm in Thailand. Is I'm 69, so it doesn't bother me, but I'm really anxious about the climate change situation. Mm, what are yeah. you behind? Yeah. And that, and yeah, also by, by, bipolar, and it really plays on my mind because I'm one of that generation of the hippies. And we always wanted to leave the world a better place, and we haven't. Hmm. Um, you know, well, hold on. First of all, Kevin, we'll come back to your, can we come back to your question um, next session? Because yeah, we've no used up all our, yeah, we've, we've right. used up all our time for this session, and I don't want to, um, I'm sure some of you might be afraid that you're not going to get a full two hour break at this point. <laughs> so. No, I don't want to, uh, I mean, we all need some rest and kind of rejuvenation between. So I'm sorry we didn't get to do any meditation during this session. I promise we will do more next session. But um, yeah, thank you all for your attention. And um, yeah, let's come back together without further ado. We'll come back together in two hours. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.